Good morning and welcome to the CAD Class Podcast. I'm Josh. I'm Jake. And each week we talk all things making, 3D printing, project organization today, and we show off the amazing projects that you guys made. So morning, morning, y'all. We're, we're super stoked to be here. I see uh, Sam in the chat, Ogre, uh, Spitfire, Joe Street. Welcome, welcome, and good morning. How's it going, everyone? A little bit different setup, trying to get better each week, yada, yada. Same stuff we always say. Yeah, we're trying to turn pro. We're, we're always pretending to be pros, but we're actually, you know, m making a little progress towards actually going pro, I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed on that. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, the whole point of this class, we wanted to do things just a little bit different. Um, normally, we just kind of keep it a little bit organic, a little bit free formed. Uh, but for this week, we actually wanted to dive in a little bit more in depth about well, project organization, but also kind of architecture within Fusion 360. That's what you wanted to do, Josh. Why did you want us to do this? I felt that one of the things that we missed out on when we were writing our book was was really helping people understand organization at the project level. And then on top of that, organization at the at the uh, like higher level, like when you're collaborating with other folks, I thought that we just... It's, it's still somewhat confusing the difference between when to use a component, when not to use a component, when to use an assembly versus a mm. sub-assembly versus... And, and I was just hoping to clarify some of that stuff today. And I figured, hey, we're on these podcasts every week anyway. What if we just did a, say, like a 30-minute masterclass and we went through exactly how to think about how to organize your files and then eventually we incorporate that back into the... Uh-oh, sound is not good. Is it just me? Yes, my that sound is fine. Fun might just be you yeah sound is good Sorry about that, man. um yeah so i will be taking you through essentially uh something that will be going on in a little bit more in depth uh during the next uh during the next book um that obviously you guys will all have access to um but it's definitely something that we miss out it's something that a lot of people get confused by you know we introduce the idea of like a 3d body and a 2d sketch and everyone kind of understands that they go okay sketch is like circles and triangles and texts and lines and arcs and that makes sense to everyone and then you say oh you can take a sketch and pull it into a 3d body like a cube and you go okay all that makes sense and then someone says the word components and it's like a container and you're like okay and then you go but a component looks exactly the same to a body and you're like yeah that's completely correct they but they are very 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 different and so we're going to be going into that and when a lot of people think about how to organize all their files and then what is the difference between components and bodies and assemblies and sub-assemblies, et cetera, et cetera, it's actually the exact same question. It's just where does your architecture end, really? Because you can go higher and higher and higher to, you know, the project and then the folder and then the and then it just goes smaller and smaller and smaller. So in this class, we're going to be going in significantly more depth than we normally do. Um, but as always, we're going to be starting off showing off you guys' amazing projects of amazing. the week. Uh, really, really, seriously amazing. Um, last week, as always, we have our now kind of new challenges of the week, I suppose. Uh, and we told we uh, we told you guys that we wanted to see uh, any type of accessory or upgrade or just a little fun thing to throw on your 3D printer that you designed and CAD modeled and then actually plugged onto your machine. And you guys did not disappoint. Holy hell, you guys <laughs> really some, went above and beyond on that. Like, some yeah. seriously, seriously impressive. Some amazing stuff came through. Yeah, so let's let's show those things off. Let's go ahead and dive in. So uh, this is going to be under the uh, I made a thing. So just starting off, uh, Andre, good lord, busy man. Um, I'm actually going to scroll up to the top where I saw his first project. So he is currently working, or he or she are currently working on, oh goodness, where was it? Um, I know I'm skipping over some people, I apologize. Uh, for this week's challenge, I just happened to get a new belt printer. The date was announced and needed some major upgrades. Uh, the first whole new tool head. That's an intense project to start off with. Like, that's crazy. Going through all of this, like, that's to design a fully new tool head that has ducting and airflow channels and this and that. That is seriously, seriously impressive. So, I mean, right off the bat, wow. <laughs> That's rad. I'm, I'm seeing Bowden tubes at the top, uh, ducted fans on either side. Um, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Uh, were you going to say something, Josh? 
I was just going to say, Andre is, I don't see him in here right now, but that's Maple Leaf Makers. Oh, rad. Yeah. yeah. So no surprise there. Um, the CFD, I'm not sure what that stands for. Um, results are <laughs> results are pretty bad. Um, I'm not. I sure think it's a continuous stuff. flow. I think it's a continuous, continuous like flow. it's like an airflow analysis. I think is what it is. Yeah, or like a particle analysis on this. So he says it's pretty bad. I'm not. I don't know enough about airflow, um, finite element element analysis to actually say whether this is good or bad. But I mean, it looks pretty rad to me. But then again, I'm biased. But good lord, that's so awesome. Uh, the 45 degree angle makes it very weird and interesting. Yes, it does. Um, for everyone that doesn't know, belt-driven uh, 3D printers, the idea is that if you have essentially a treadmill instead of just a normal uh, 220 by 220 build plate, then you can essentially continuously roll this treadmill and then you now have a pretty normal width, pretty normal height, but then an infinite Z-axis. That's the idea. Uh, and so because of this, you need to, you can't print totally vertical. You actually need to tilt your print head 45 degrees. Uh, this is where you can actually build up diagonal layers instead of uh, vertical layers, which is a little confusing for a lot of people, but um, it's a tricky little thing to get started, as I've seen. Um, so he's now building out more of the, uh, more of the, the hot end built into it, which I love to see. Um I will continue. I will go back. I promise. Uh, and then uh, instead of improving the ducts, I improved everything else. Uh, and doing this animation, I absolutely love these animations so much. This is just so extra. And if you're making something like this, where it's 3D printable and you're going to be giving it, giving the files to someone else, these animations are just absolutely perfect. It's what you want to see, where it shows the assembly process, where things go, what the size of everything is. Andre, absolute hats off to you. This is amazing. Two I love thumbs up. Kind of amazing. Stuff. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, his three quarters of it still need to find the box fans for it. That's rad as well. I absolutely cannot wait to see the final product. It's going to be so fantastic. So cool. Oh, God, uh, um, computational fluid dynamics cfd beautiful yeah yeah oh it's right there. shout out to ogre <laughs> <laughs> open foam all right yeah yeah damn that is super rad um and then everyone else as always made really fantastic projects we'd love to show off is animation included in the free version of fusion yes 360? it is a uh, fun fact it's no longer fusion 360 it, it is, is in fact Autodesk fusion Autodesk fusion um, I believe so. We, uh, I'm 95% positive that it is included in the free I believe version. it is. I believe it is. And it's what we go over in the, oh gosh, in chapter 11 uh, of the course and the end of the book. Uh, it's the last thing we do. It's where you can essentially work with exploded diagrams. Uh, if you're trying, if you start off with the final product and then explode it in very, exploding makes it sound like it just goes boom and then everything's apart. But exploded diagrams are like, okay, you take off this thing, then this comes apart, then this comes out, uh, where it's a little bit more methodical and engineering. Uh, but yeah, we go over all of that. So exploded diagram takes things apart. Uh, what you saw Maple Leaf Makers did was be an, an assembly. So putting things together. And it's the exact same process. You just reverse the video. So pretty, pretty simple. Uh, Derriere, my wife needed some alphabet stamps for clay. Uh, so he's building out a whole punch system, essentially. Amazing. Which is just so rad. This is the kind so of stuff I just cool. love. I love like, it. Like, this would be almost impossible to find in real life or ridiculously expensive because it's so niche. But just being, like, I can't imagine this took more than, what, a couple hours to make. And it's just fantastic. Hey, there we go. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh they did dual colors as well. I mean, this is just so awesome. I love so this kind awesome. of stuff. Yep. Oh, God, that's so cool. Yeah, I love to see this kind of thing. Um, I also really love to see rendering. Um, one thing that everyone should know, obviously rendering pictures takes a really long amount of time. Uh, as you can see, the right half of this photo is just kind of blank. Uh, you can shorten your rendering time by, oh gosh, probably probably quarter of the amount of time that it takes to make this just by messing around with the aspect ratio. So he's obviously just trying to show off uh, just this punch section. So you can mess around with the aspect ratio, pull in the width, 
And then instead of rendering uh, all of this blank space in all this project that he actually doesn't want to show in this picture, you're only rendering what you need. So it makes your file size way smaller and it reduces the rendering time from like 25 minutes to 10 minutes. So marked improvement. Um, yeah, I love to see this kind of stuff. So rad. So rad. Joe Street so, says, I'm loving all the creations this week. Yeah, it's our, yeah. frankly, I mean, again, I think we've been shouting you all out each week. Joe Street, PC Van Vliet, Sam, I think I saw you in here too. And all the other moderators are saving our lives. It's allowing us to continue to make content and also interact with the community and keep the discord mm -hmm. fresh. So you guys, you guys totally rock. I, yes. I don't feel like I Massive can say thank you, you enough. Yeah, I, I'll, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Uh, and then continuing on again with Daria, uh, making something for his bamboo, a, mix, uh, a mixture of fusion, Hue Forge, and bamboo studios. Daria prints. That's so rad. So it looks like he's printing. Oh, I thought this was an actual, like, like a resin picture, but this is, this is a printed thing. That is a Hue Forge 3D print, which I can't wait to use Hue Forge ah, for okay. our eventual mechanical business cards. I am that's really excited. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that yeah, that's kick-ass. Hue Forge, that apparently, is. I mean, I think we've talked about it a couple times on here, but people seem really to love Hue Forge, and I, I just can't wait to dive in and try it. Mm -hmm. Especially when we uh, have those Prusa XLs coming to Sac City College here in Sacramento. I know, that's, that's going to be very fun. Um, well, for everyone that doesn't know, that, uh, the <laughs> idea of Hue Forge is that you're basically, you're able to use all these different colors with a multi-spool 3D printer, and you're able to essentially print out a picture not just by doing it with layers but also shading as well very very technical very very difficult thing to do computationally probably impossible to do uh, just with design with cad uh, but you get these really really kick-ass results yeah i absolutely love this love um, and, it. Then, uh, and then i think to finish us off uh, and then ogre made uh, a mounted spool thing so it is uh, it's actually put in the middle of his printer so it's really unfortunate but it happens to a lot of people where if you don't store your filament correctly that would be in let's say a ziploc gallon bag with some desiccant in it that silica packet uh your filament is going to be absorbing moisture from the air and if you live in a humid climate or it rains a lot or you live next to the ocean then it's going to be absorbing all that airborne moisture into your plastic Obviously, when that goes into the hot end, as we know, that converts to steam, which then puffs out the volume and it gives you really ugly prints. The other flip side of that, which is an even worse thing, is it makes all of your filament incredibly brittle. Like you can literally snap it with your fingers with very little resistance. Uh, so if you have a subpar bit of filament where it's not so wet that it's actually going to cause that puffing thing, but it's just a little bit moist, it will still crack, depending on the brand, which sucks. But what can exacerbate that as a problem is if you have your spool mounted in a oops, uh, mounted in a certain orientation or going down really harsh angles where it's curving so much where it literally just snaps. Uh, I've literally set like a 12-hour print to go and then, oh yeah, first day looks great, I'm going to go to bed, I wake up and it's just a big pile of or No, nothing happens because the filament just snaps. Uh, my printer doesn't know about it. And then it just continuously moves the hot end thinking that everything's fine. So it's a huge bummer. So if you can design something uh, where your filament is going directly into your hot end as smooth as possible with as little resistance, that's great. Uh, if you have a direct drive system where your filament is literally going directly into your hot end, uh, then you can kind of mount it anywhere. You have a lot more flexibility. Uh, what uh, uh, what Ogre is doing right here, he's putting it directly overhead. So it's the best case scenario. It isn't absolutely necessary to make it you know perfect, uh, but it definitely does help. Um, if on the flip side, you're using a Bowden 3D printer where you have that PTFE tube, where the extruder mechanism is outside of the hot end, uh, then you actually do need to take that into consideration way more. That's why people have uh, all their spools mounted on the side or upside down, so it's feeding directly into it. There's lots of different things that you can do. Um, that's why one of people's first 3D prints that they do, 
uh, is printing a filament guide where it's a little arm. It's what we make in uh, chapter one of the book, uh, where it's a little arm where it just pushes the inlet of where your filament is going just a little bit further out. So you're getting this larger radius uh, of your filament going into the extruder. So it makes for a much, much, much better or a much higher likeliness of a successful print. So this is fantastic. I love this kind of stuff. Amazing. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Um, and then we have Garfed. Did we see the, the creation from Garfed here? Uh, what was that? It is February 3rd. I don't know if I saw this. Uh, There's a wrench. They made the wrench for the little odd-sized. Oh, I th oh my gosh. I think I totally did see this. Ah, where was it? I'm not a professional. It's on the I made a thing. Just scroll back to 2, 3, 2024. February 3rd. It's got like the little break there. Oh, yes. I did see this. Yeah, this made me very, very happy. Custom tools. I I really adore. Yeah, really funky, weird bolts that exist. I, I, I don't actually know why. Like if, if you have a security specialized bolt head that's fine that's obviously fine but then if you sell that driver or that nut publicly it kind of defeats the point right like do, do we all understand that <laughs> like like there's there's some companies that have proprietary um you know only screws in but can't be screwed out bolt heads and then they will also sell you the driver that can remove it Cool. That's great. That's so niche. People aren't going to be able to find that. But then they also sell the driver on Amazon for like five bucks. And you're like, then it's not. Then it's not security. Then it's not a security. <laughs> <laughs> like, <I'm> a... <sighs> anyway, anyway, absolutely love this. Uh, I love making uh, all different kinds of wrenches. Weirdly enough, one of the projects that I've wanted to make um, for so 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 long, but. Um, but I haven't done is uh, the NASA wrench. I've been uh, meaning yeah, to print yeah, this yeah. so, so, so long. Uh, so for all guys that don't know, um, the ISS has a 3D printer uh, where you can obviously send files to it and then it prints it out. And it's like, well, why would you bring up a bunch of tools that you may not use when you can just 3D print the tool for the job? Uh, and so they made a little, or they sent a file to this very special 3D printer that can work in zero G, um, and it's and it just made this this wrench or a torque wrench that limited out at like three newton centimeters or something. I don't even know. Um, and and it totally worked. And because it's NASA and it's a public company, they just gave this this file to uh, to the world. So it's technically the first functional print. It isn't the first print in space. I think that was like a name tag or something kind of lame. Um, but the first functional print was a wrench and I've been meaning to print it for so, so, so long. I did print it, it on a, on a, uh, on my very first 3d printer, this mono price select V2 mini, which was like this big, uh, and surprise, surprise, it didn't work. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I need to reprint it on the Prusa and actually uh... get a successful print. We've got some other, other cool stuff in there too, Jake. I, we've got the hex, the label, the... 3D printed bolt holder there from Mr. Mist Mr. Mitnick, PC Van Vliet, just above the last one. We've got even more stuff. And we have another one I want to show off. Yeah, so if you, that's that bolt holder right there, just above the tool cut. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I love I I I think <laughs> everyone knows that I've I have a bit of an obsession with this kind and, of stuff with like yeah. hardware and organizing hardware, especially. Um, so I absolutely adore this kind of stuff. Like organizing things to very niche specificity is like my idea of a good time uh and then actually <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then actually printing like an entire mini toolbox for it that's hysterical that's that's so, so hysterical well, it's a nice touch it's a really nice touch it's, it's funny touch. I, the, there was 3d prints that got popular for a while that were basically just mini replicas of things that we i, I here's i here's how i frame it i think there are certain iconic designs in society and some of them are so ubiquitous that we stop even noticing that they're an iconic design. One of them would be like the green trash can. And so there's this whole community or the traffic cone is mm -hmm. a little bit iconic, right? And so uh, you get these 3D printing communities and these 3D prints, these people that make basically replicas of those things. And it just cracks me up. 
when people do it. Uh, we have a couple more things. We have um, so Johnny Yurta fan wanted us to show off what he made there, and but his is in the challenges oh. section. He's so if you challenge. pop over, because there's a couple cool things in the challenges, like Serdar as well making the big tea mug, Mister Mitnick. Shout out to this you. I'm pretty... uh, you know, I've got a, yeah. I've got my giant mug right now that you mentioned that, <laughs> but uh, it's not nearly as cool. I don't think as as what Serdar made they, there. So. No, that's pretty nice. And then just above, this is so it's making, the truth. Yep, making a an actual holder or an, or an external holder for your uh, for your screens. That's so rad. So so this is so the idea with uh, all these kind of mechanisms is that if you put a three D printer in a heated enclosure um, or, or an insulated enclosure, even more specific, um, it holds onto that heat and you get much better chan or much better layered layer adhesion success. So some materials like ABS, you need it to be in a heated enclosure because while it's printing, if it cools down too fast into room temperature, you get layer, oh gosh, a delamination. That's the word. Uh, the same thing happens if you leave like a sheet of plywood in the rain and then it just kind of absorbs it and then dries out and all the layers are starting to split and come apart. Uh, same thing happens with 3D prints. So uh, uh, you can see he's actually printing in PLA plus, so it's even more of a benefit. You just get stronger and stronger prints. Um, but the inside of that, it becomes hot. It essentially comes just a little bit higher uh, than your bed temperature because you're then adding the heat uh, of the nozzle. And so if you set your bed to 60, it can get up to 65 degrees Celsius, which is, oh gosh, what is that? 100 and somebody in the chat, I'm sure will know, 120 or something? That's like Egypt on a sunny day. Uh, <laughs> it's it's like opening up the oven and going, oh god. Um, so uh, even if you're just printing PLA, uh, you will still get an even higher strength because even the layers below that have already been printed, those are now fusing together and staying in a glass state where it's not liquid, it's not solid, it's just kind of floppy, uh, and it. It just gives you killer prints as far as strength. So absolutely fantastic. Oh, the whole purpose I started on this. You can't keep electronics in there. So the motherboard, the PSU, the screen, you got to yank those outside uh, because they can't sustain at that high temperatures. God, full circle on that one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so pulling it out. Great idea. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, and then what am I looking for? Oh, that was it. That was the one that was Johnny. You're a fan. Uh, oh, he's, it's, yeah. he's, it's the when people have Discord. different names on YouTube and different names on the Discord, <laughs> I know, and then obviously their own names. Oh, that's so hard. Um, but absolutely, absolutely fantastic, dude. Yeah, this is a killer design, amazing, love it. All right, uh, do we want to get onto the, onto the topic of the evening? I think we should get into the topic of the evening. Let's get into the, the organization masterclass. So, the whole purpose. Uh, of this class is basically we're going to be using this as a organic test trial uh, for what we're going to be putting into the book. Uh, as you know, Fusion 360 or any programs are gigantic. And there's lots of things that I know about these programs. And then you just dig a little bit deeper and you find more and more stuff. And you go, oh, yeah, actually, there's also this thing. Uh, so this podcast is going to be used as a refresher course for me to be rediscovering all the really, really fantastic tools in there. Uh, and then also just going over really any of the more necessary bit of information that you need to know for this. And then we're going to start off uh, basically at the highest level and then go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So we're going to be starting with project and we're going to be ending with sketches. So that's the that's the linear scale. OK. All right. Um, uh, and then I'm going to be using my R2D2 project, which. I've put on hold a little bit, long, long-term projects. I'm planning on building uh, a full, full-size R2-D2 replica, uh, like fully motorized, all made of metal. Uh, and I've been catting it up slowly over the course, like what, a year? I, easily, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> um, total side note, uh, if anyone uh, in the chat is from California or is vacationing and going to uh, LA, I cannot recommend enough that you guys go to the Academy Museum. It is fantastic. 
it is full of every single famous movie prop and things that you can possibly imagine from stuff that you're like, oh my god, I'm so happy that they kept this from some of the most famous movies of all time. And I won't spoil it. I, uh, If you do go there, do not look at any of the reviews or pictures because you don't want it to spoil you. I want you to go through and they go, oh my god! Uh, but what I will spoil is they do have uh, one of the original R two D twos, and it is uh, he's 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 beautiful. He's lovely. I took all of these reference pictures. <laughs> I literally brought a pair of calipers to, <laughs> to the museum so I could hold it up and then take a picture for scale. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I, I was with I was with my fiance and uh, and she, <laughs> and she was like. Are you crying again? Like, yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> and then apparently the, uh, the there was like a security guard just off to the side who was also like a museum person, and she was just chatting with him, and she's like, "How many people come over here and start crying?" And he's like, "Several people every day." She's like, "I get dads who come here, and they just burst." Into tears. <laughs> it's kind of beautiful though. But anyway, said that yeah, to make you feel if, better. Yeah, if you ever go uh, to Los Angeles, go there. Uh, and then across the street is the automotive car museum, which is gigantic. I think they have like a billion dollar, billion dollars worth of cars. It's amazing. Anyway, come back to CAD. Uh, let's go into Fusion 360, if you don't mind. Yep. And then we're going to go ahead and full screen this, unless you want to show yourself. Uh, nah, no, 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 no. Let's show us. Show us? Yeah. Okay. So, um, First off, uh, I'm going to be showing you guys uh, essentially all of the organization that I have for all of my files, uh, and then what you guys should do for our Fusion course, essentially. Um, we're going to be starting out in the data panel. If you don't see this, uh, you want to click on these uh, three by three grid squares, uh, and this will show you all of your projects. When you first opened up Fusion for the first time, it probably said, uh, or you probably didn't see any of these, uh, you just saw my recent data at the top, well, admin files, which is your projects, uh, demo projects. And then if you scroll way to the bottom, then it had libraries and assets, and then some of these basic trainings. Uh, we've never actually gone over these, so we may as well. Uh, all of these samples, um, just showing off different CAD projects within the different uh, workspaces, these are, these are fine. So these have, these are essentially pre-made models uh, so, for example, in the uh, modeling, they've got... Oh, what do they have here? Oh, a, a Geneva drive. Cool. So this is just to show off uh, all the fun things that you could make in CAD. And then uh, Fusion 360 or Autodesk has uh, articles that essentially go along with all of these. So this is a very, very popular 3D model. Um, I wonder if it works. No, it doesn't. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move that. Um, so these are all pre-made models that you can use to basically work with articles on Fusion. We've done it in the past. They're fine. The articles are fine. They're a little bit, they're a little bit sterile, if that makes sense. Um, where it's like, do this, do that, do that, do that. And there's not a ton of explanation about design intent, which is probably why you're using a CAD program to make stuff. And it's just saying, here's all the tools, here's what they do. Next. It's not really the way that we like to work, so you can skip that. Uh, the libraries, the assets, this is all of the behind the scenes information that you really don't need to touch. Uh, the notable exceptions, uh, if you have a CNC machine uh, and you make a CAD model, then you make all the tool paths like we do in chapter eight of the book. Yeah. Um, then you need to basically have a bit of information called a post right here, cam post. This is the in-between between your tool paths that you make and then putting it through an information that your uh, CNC machine understands. Uh, if you are a 3D printer person, then the idea is if you open up Cura or Prusa Slicer, you need to select which 3D printer you have. It doesn't matter what your model is, because if you design it for a Prusa machine, and then you send it to an Ender 3, it won't understand that. There's no, well, they're two different machines. So you need to have and in between. So this is where you put in information about your about your CNC machine. That's basically the only thing in here that you ever really need to touch. So if you don't have a CNC machine, you never have to look into this. Uh, you can change any of the names of these just by right-clicking on them and saying rename. 
uh, that can be really, really handy. So where it says, uh, what is it, admin files, just change it to your name, change it to anything that you want. Um, but all of these sections, these are called projects. You can see right here, if you want to make a new one, you can call it new project. There is absolutely no rhyme or reason why you should make any folder or any project for any topic that you want. Uh, when I was working at my workshop, I wanted to segregate all of my projects that I was making based on the area of a workshop. So I have stuff for my 3D printer. I've got metalworking projects. I have woodworking projects. And that's just kind of the areas that I like to split it up. So I know that I don't have this gigantic, never-ending list of all of my projects. It's just the ones for those areas. So that's what I like to do. Uh, if you have a really, really big project, uh, for example, my R2D2 build, that's huge. That's going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of components. So to hide it inside metalworking, you can do that, but it's a little bit easier just to make it available on your home screen. Uh, same thing for any of my other things. Um, so uh, CAD class, this is where I have all of our projects as well, and we'll be going into that in a little bit. Uh, but you can organize this however you'd like, really. Um, one thing that I will say is you can treat this and all of the organization in Fusion 360 as folders, just like you have in your computer. So you can imagine that all of these are like the, the macro folders, where it's like documents, downloads, desktop, pictures, videos, music, et cetera, et cetera. But those are the main things, and then you store folders inside it. That's the idea. So if I'm wanting to go into my R2D2 project, you kind of have to think quite a lot about how you organize your folders. So if I'm working on a really, really big project like R2D2, uh, where he has, oh gosh, something like th over 4,000 components, like individual bolts and then panels and stuff like that, um, you wouldn't just put every single one of those components in just one project because that's a huge list that you have to scroll through. Even if you have a good naming convention, that's a nightmare. That is such a pain to do. So what I like to do is kind of lay out all of my folders, how it's going to be later down the line so I can stay as organized as possible. Um, my ideology with this is that if I have, I think it's something like 20, 20 items inside a folder, or more, I you kind of want to split it up into more things. You can essentially you can scroll forever and ever through uh, this little skinny side panel, but at a certain point that becomes impractical, and you may as well just put half of those in a folder and the other half in another folder. That's the idea. So I split this up into. Uh, ooh, my mouse is done. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> uh, I've split this up into the body, the dome, uh, and my legs. Seriously, my mouse is just broken. It broke. Oh no. Okay. It totally just broke. <laughs> That's fine. Second mouse to the rescue. Is this gonna work? Oh my god. No, there it goes. Aha. Oh, I can use both. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Crisis avoided. A stupid thing. Anyway, uh, so I've got all of these organized. So I first started off working on R2D2's legs, which are way more complicated than people think. Um the idea is that uh, I'm essentially working with assemblies and sub-assemblies. So you can kind of, if you're a car guy and you are thinking about the manufacturing process, you can think of the entire car as an assembly. And then you can say, all right, that assembly is made up of sub-assemblies. So for example, the engine, uh, the driver's chair, the chassis, the wheels, where they're smaller sections that have many parts within it. And you can make as many sub-assemblies as you want. You can go in as deep as you'd like. It's purely personal preference. Uh, so for me, there is a, a large community of people who make uh, these R2-D2s. So there's already pre-made sections of all of the legs. So for example, uh, the, sh uh, ooh, what's a good one? Uh, the booster covers. No, that's just a simple one. Uh, I'm gonna show off the shoulder hub. Yeah, that's fairly interesting. Okay. So the shoulder hub of R2-D2, I'm actually going to bring up. Uh, so this is all of the parts. These are all of my folders. So in the main page, on the homepage, uh, they are called projects. But as you go deeper and deeper into it, 
It is now called folders. They are exactly the same thing. They are just called different things for whatever reason. So I've got all of my folders of all of my individual sub assemblies. And then at the very, very bottom, I have my leg assembly. This is where I'm combining all of my sub assemblies into a larger file. So this is the leg assembly. This is a very big file. Uh, so it may take, so it may be uh, a little slow to load because we're also streaming. Um, but this is all combined. And then I would combine the two legs, the body and the dome into an even larger uh, main file. So this is all the parts that go into RTD2's legs. I actually completed this, thankfully. Uh, and you can see these are all of the individual sub assemblies. So I have the shoulder hydraulics, the shoulder buttons, the uh, ankle cylinders, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these sub assemblies match all of these folder names right here. Uh, I like to number them because they're usually organized by name, but you can change that to whatever you'd like. Um, God, I just love this project so much. Anyway, uh, so we're going to be talking about the shoulder hub number two, uh, which is this little section right there. It's actually a fairly complicated bit. Um, yeah, R2D2 just looks like a big block of metal until you actually look very closely at him, and then you go, oh my god, it's so many pieces. Yeah, there is. Uh, okay, so one of my sub-assemblies I have in my folder. So if I click on that, you can now see that I've got uh, individual parts, a sub-assembly, which is right here. This is my shoulder hub assembly. Then I have uh, individual files. So these would be external components because they are not within the assembly. They are outside. They are saved as individual components and then brought into an assembly file. Uh, so for example, uh, I'm going to open up the uh, the assembly shoulder hub. If it'll open up. So this is my sub-assembly that is made up of these four components. Because I knew that I was going to be dealing with a project that has over 4,000 parts, it makes more sense to use external components, not internal components. And for, for the people in the chat, external components, I think somebody asked this question specifically, external mm -hmm. components are only available in the paid version of Fusion yes. 360. Um, and in our course, the halfway point, when we discuss in a little bit more in depth in our video course, we also teach you uh, exactly how you can get the paid version of Fusion 360 completely for free. Uh, so yeah. Um, so uh, with this sub assembly, because I knew there was so many components, uh, it doesn't make sense to have 4,000 components in one file. That's ridiculous spread it out. And so I've got all of these individual components uh, that I've uh, saved inside this folder and then dragged into the assembly. And then I can join all of these pieces together. Great, fantastic. And because I'm going to be manufacturing all of these myself as an extra step, I went through and made individual drawings or engineering drawings of every single component as well. Uh, obviously not necessary for every single project, but if I'm manufacturing something for myself or I'm giving it over to a buddy that has a mill or a lathe uh, or anything like that, then I do want to have all of these dimensions and material and really as built out as well as possible. It's taking forever to load. I'll just kill. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So I've got individual drawings for every single, uh, every single parts. And then if you can see right here, uh, I've got the assembly of or the assembly process of this entire sub-assembly. Did I just say sub-assembly like a thousand times? Yeah, I, I think you're just, that's just a sub-assembly, 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 sub-assembly. Yeah. So um, going from that, so the project is the main thing, then the folders will be split up smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to a sub-assembly, uh, which is right here, which is made up of components that get joined together. All good, okay. So in this, we know that this is an assembly file of this because the little icon right there at the top corner is three white cubes that are stacked together, like building blocks. Great. Inside of the components, that's the top assembly file, is all of my individual components. You can see that because it's only one white cube. So you've got assembly up top, which is made up of four components. 
Uh, I can expand all of these and you can see that I've got bodies and sketches that make up this component. You'll notice that right next to my white cube is a, a little chain link. This is indicating that uh, all of these components are external components. I am linking them, hence the chain link, from this folder into this assembly file. So this assembly file is actually quite small because all of the data associated with all of the individual parts are stored externally. It's the same idea that if you've ever used any video editing software, it isn't, or the actual video editing file is not very big. It's maybe only like, what, a couple hundred megabytes? And that's because you're not storing all of those 4K videos inside it. They're linking externally and saying, okay, that's where I know that file is. That's where I know that sound, that B-roll. And then you are referencing it. Same thing for this. This assembly file, very snappy, very quick because all of it is external. Um, if this was my entire project and I only had four parts, then it's such a small thing in its entirety that I may as well just use internal components because then I don't need to make a folder and deal with all of that organizing and stuff like that. It's just held in one thing. So that's great. So the components, uh, if I hide all the rest, isolate, there we go. So this is the hub ring, okay? The component is the folder. It is the container of every single bit of information that goes into making this 3D object. It is not just the 3D object. It is also any of the sketches and images and construction planes that go into making it. That is the big differentiator between component and body. You can see that my body right here looks almost identical. If I click on the body one and then I click on the component, the exact same thing is highlighted. What you don't see is that this component also includes the sketch. You can see this is just a revolved part. So if I get rid of the body, I still only have the sketch. So it's made up of multiple parts. So the component you can kind of think of as the container or a folder that all of your files or bodies, sketches, etc., are held inside. There's two types of components, external and internal. I'm working on a large project, so I'm using external components. If I was just working on a quick little project, I'd probably use internal components, but it's person to person, essentially. So what you don't see in here is that under the component, you can also have uh, lots of other things. So we just have bodies and sketches right now, but you can also have any of the construction planes that go into making that project. So for example, the surfboard that we make in the chapter one of our book, it includes, I think, four offset planes, and that would be held inside the components. They're not a part of the 3D body. They're not a part of a sketch. They are a separate entity. Uh, when we go into doing the electric guitar project, where we actually pull in an image uh, or a canvas, as Fusion calls it, of that guitar, and then you trace around it, that is not a sketch, or it's not a construction plane, or it's not a body. It is a separate entity that is held inside the component. There's a couple extras, but those are the main ones that you really need to worry about. Uh, the other thing that confuses a lot of people is that every single component also has its own origin, which can be a little confusing. Um, all of these share the exact same origin. That's why you, as you uh, turn on more and more of these origins, it's just getting darker and darker. Um, but there is the local origin to every single component. And then there is the global origin to the assembly. Um, but really, you can just turn that off for most of your projects. Uh, did I miss anything, Josh? I don't think so. You don't think so? Okay. Um, I actually did, and I'll show you what that is. Um, as you work on a design and you make changes and updates and, oh, I bought this new part. It's actually this dimension. You need to make changes and resave it. You'll end up with versions. So if I click or if I hover over any of these components, you can see the name, two, shoulder, hub, crown, JOS, uh, and then version three. That means that I have worked on this three times and I've arrived at the final process. So if I go into, where is it? The shoulder crown, you can see that it also says version three. I can click this 
and I can see a design history. So you can see I started off with uh, a little bit of a, oh, that's actually really small for you guys to see. That's fine. I will open that up. Uh, I started off just by uh, revolving this kind of weird cup. Uh, and then I made all the cutouts in version two as I was kind of starting to figure out uh, exactly how it was made. Uh, then I ended up with version three, which is uh, the one with the aluminum finish on it. That's great. If you click on any of these previous versions, you will see that there is a warning symbol right on the component name and on the link at the top. This means that it is out of date, that it needs to be updating. Um, I'm not ever going to be using these, so I don't need to mess with that uh, because all I care about is that the most recent version, uh, this one right here, doesn't have any issues whatsoever. So this is the most up-to-date version. That's what I'm using. Uh, you can see that there's dates and times and uh, different folders for all of these. Uh, one thing that you can do is also set what's called a milestone. Um, if I can open this up and it'll show me. Yeah, see all these different 13 versions. Oh, you need to be able to right-click it. Um, I'm sure it's in there some somewhere. Hmm. Strange. Um, you can also make... Uh, I'll try and find it later. Uh, you can also make what's called Milestone. So if you have something like 100 versions of this, obviously it's a little hard to find just that one important previous version. So you can uh, right-click this, I'm sure you guys can find it, uh, where it's saying it may not be the most recent version, but it's somewhere in between where you're like, hey, this is a really important revision. This is a milestone in the design. Uh, you can signify that. And then if you have a spreadsheet, if you're working on a product development, you go, oh God, what did we change from you know, version 1.5 to version 2.3 or whatever? What were the major changes? That's when you can have a spreadsheet and actually log all those changes. So that's the big thing. Uh, you can also click on uses, which shows you exactly what goes into the subassembly. Used in, which shows where is this file actually being brought into. You can see this is used in the leg assembly. And then it also has any drawings that use that as well. Um, the other nice thing is that you can actually view all these details on the web. So uh, what a lot, a lot of people actually don't know, strangely enough, um, you all have a cloud account on Fusion. So every single file that you have is not only on your program saved into your data panel, it's also saved on your online account. So you can use Fusion 360 online to actually work essentially as a CAD viewer. So you can pull this part onto uh, your desktop and then actually measure it, check out the different, uh, the different sizes, pull it into different things. So it's a really small file size that you can then send to people and then it offers them to download it. So instead of setting, sending them the entire CAD file, which can be quite large, you can just send them a link and then they can just download it. So it makes life a lot easier with this. Um, what else is going on in there? Uh, you can uh, organize all your lists as much as you like by clicking this gear. You can also offline any projects. So uh, Fusion is an online program, so you need to be able to be linked to the internet, hence having a cloud account. Uh, but if you ever to, uh, go off of Wi-Fi, you'll notice that it's going, oh, you can't do anything. That's not true. You can. Uh, if you go into uh, this little clock icon in the top corner, the job status, you can actually uh, move this slider open and it says working offline. So any of the versions and any of the changes that you have are now being saved to your local drive. So then when you go back onto online, it's then pulling all that information from your drive and putting it up to the cloud and then updating your entire model. Uh, we got a question in here from Joestry, which says, do you have to yeah, recreate sorry. a part if you realize that an older part is more accurate or an older version is more accurate? Nope. Uh, if you go into any of the versions, uh, and I uh, let, let's say, oh, my version two actually was the one that I wanted. Uh, you can open that up and then click on this little, uh, or any, any of these warning icons. Uh, I won't do it. Uh, but as soon as you click it, that now makes it the most up-to-date version. That moves it to the top of the list. So you can view, so you can have any version that you want be the most recent used version, essentially. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. 
What time? Oh, we're almost done. Ah. Um, okay. Uh, one thing that I do want to say that f uh, for you guys that are actually doing our course, um, we want you guys to start off as organized as possible. So if there's anyone on this podcast who actually hasn't started or maybe just started uh, their program, I would definitely make uh, a new project called CAD class or Mastering Future 360, whatever you want to do. Uh, and this is where you can hold your entire project. So we, we recommend organizing it where every single week is a new folder. Uh, it just makes life a little bit easier. And then you can see as soon as I click on this, then it shows me all of my projects that go into it. So then you can click onto any of the projects, like we were talking about the surfboard earlier, uh, open that up, and now you have access to it. And it's all held uh, and organized into the week or the chapter. Uh, one thing I did mention earlier about the construction planes being inside the components. So here you go. We have all of our construction planes right here. Oh, some of them are different sizes. That's strange. Anyway, um, the construction sketches that make up our project and the body, all of these are inside the component. So don't think of a component just as the 3D model because it's full of a lot more stuff than that. All right, I think uh, I think that's all. That was all pretty done. solid. Any questions in the chat? Anything Actually, that's a anything little bit else. unclear that when you're thinking about building or starting your new project that you that wasn't answered just now that's maybe still a little bit confusing. We'd love to answer those questions live if you mm -hmm. have any. Oh god, <laughs> I love this project so much. I can't wait to make this. Oh, it's going to be a glorious, glorious time. <laughs> of what I've heard from people who have made these, uh, who actually worked on the original uh, R2-D2s, who have <laughs> not stole designs from the Lucas archives, but certainly copied them down, um, that uh, to make your own R2-D2 can take anywhere between 5 and 20 years to make. It's that wow. big of a project. Wow. Yeah. So just the CAD has taken me a year, essentially, just to make a leg um, with project and reference images and how do you build it, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. Um, yeah, and it can cost thousands and thousands of dollars. But So Spitfire in, has but a great end. idea. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go on. Uh, Spitfire has a good Spitfire. idea here. He said, uh, that's my project for this week is get my CAD class file organized. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is going to be I your challenge are. for the week. It is going to be to work on your organization system, either within an individual project or probably for starters, organize those files and start to poke around those folders and figure out uh, you know, how to put things in order inside mm -hmm. of the program. I think that is a great challenge for the week. Absolutely. And it's one of those challenges that will lead you to more productivity for all the other challenges that we... Yes, it will. It absolutely will. It makes life so much easier. Um, um, Johnny Yurtafan also says, oh, I haven't been saving my files. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what happens when you just exit out of Fusion 360 after having made something? Yeah, so this may be a shock to people. Um, I don't save every file that I work on. If I'm just making a simple project that I know I'm only ever going to have one thing. For example, uh, if I was making this little trophy that we talked about in our most recent YouTube short, um, this base, like I'm only going to be making one of these trophies. I really don't need to save and organize exactly where everything is because it's just a simple thing. Um, I may make a design and then uh, send it off to my 3D printer and then be done with it. And that's fine. That's okay. What you don't want to do is work on a project that you think is not that important. And then you realize, oh, wow, I've had a few people asking for me to make it or make one for them. Oh, God, maybe I should have saved it. So if you absolutely know that you're never going to be using that file, think really long and hard about it because you may end up saving it. So if you're just building you know, something dead simple, like a, a cylinder, uh, for example, um, I would really recommend save all of your projects. These Fusion 360 files are so small um, and it's free storage. You don't have to pay for it. So you may as well just work with it. Um, if you ever, if you are going to save it, uh, you want to say exactly what is the location. So you can see my um, 
my project, that's the most, that's the largest of the architecture, is CAD class, then the 12-week program, then the single parts week, then you can name it and click save. That's the idea. So save as many things as you can, stay organized, especially with your name. One thing that I often forget to do is name things in a way where it's easily searchable. So you can go through and search any project that you want um, and it will actually show you. So if I go uh, surfboard uh, and click search, uh, it's gonna show me my project and I can right click it and actually go, I can add this to my offline, I can delete it. Uh, I can move it between different files, which is sometimes not easy to do. Uh, I can share this link, I can do anything I really want with it. Um, but naming it easily, easily to find names is hyper, hyper critical. Um, it is one of the, one of the worst things that I did starting off and I wish I did sooner essentially. So that's my, that's my two cents with it. Awesome. And how often, so you open a project, you save it right away? No. No, okay. no, no, no. So what is there, is there an autosave functionality? And this is, I'm trying that to ask is, broad questions. What happens to files as you work? Mm. Uh, if you click on your profile and go into preferences uh, and go into ba, 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 design, no. Oh, uh, preview, no. Bloody hell, where is it? Hang on, is it general? Is it not general? No. There is some setting in here, I promise, where you're able to um, select uh, when things are saved. Oh, uh, data collection? No. Gosh, where is it? This is terrible. Um, there is some setting in here. I'm not exactly sure where it is, but you're able to set up how many days since something has happened that you actually do want it to be saved. Um, and uh, the larger that you set this value, the well the slower your program can be because it's saving larger files uh, essentially into a cache gosh where i literally just used it yes ah there it is ah automatic recovery backup interval uh so i most people have it set to five minutes so every five minutes it's storing the most recent version uh into a basically an auto save feature um, so, so then let's say crashes so yes, yeah, so exactly. So let's say the computer crashes, you're right in the middle of your project. What what do you do then? Um, hopefully you have automatic version on close already checked. So it will save that. So as soon as you, oh gosh, my computer's breaking. And then it actually, you know, <laughs> uh, as soon as you open Fusion back up, you can always go into my recent data uh, and it will show up every single part that you actually did open up. So that's a nice little place to see. So there is a possibility that if it's like the autosave functionality in Microsoft Word, if you are working mm -hmm. on something and you feel like you've lost a ton of work, go back in there, check your recent data. Yeah. There's a there's a good chance that it's there so long as your settings are correct. And by the way, I think one of the things that people don't do often enough is actually go and check that preferences box and go through all of the different preferences that mm -hmm. Autodesk presets for you. I think we can just take for granted what they do. And then we we don't take control of our own software and make it do the things that we want it to do. For example, um, I actually changed my mouse settings. I no longer use the default Fusion 360 mouse functionality. Really? Because, yeah, because Ethan. I found that... I, Ethan, Josh. Because I found that I like to right-click to, to orbit instead of Ew. holding shift and clicking to orbit. And so uh, my right-click is an orbit, and I got used to that coward. in... Uh, <laughs> I got used to that in... Um, on shape when I was poking around with on shape, and I said, you know, I actually bit. prefer not having. And it's funny because in on shape, you have to hold shift and press E to extrude something. So I'm like, this is this is like completely unnecessary. I extrude way too often for this to be mm -hmm. a shift E function. I feel the same way about the mouse. I'm like, I yeah. I need to orbit way too often. Why am I clicking two buttons <laughs> to do that? Or why you know like why do I have to hold yeah. shift and click the middle mouse wheel? It's like this is crazy. Yeah. This is crazy. So I think actually you're wrong, Jake. That's what I think. I uh, screw you then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else with saving? So I think, okay, so crashed files, we talked hierarchy and structure. I think mm -hmm. where some people start to get a little bit confused is when you get into the sub assemblies, you have a component at the top 
and mm -hmm. and then you create a new component inside of that component and then there's another new component and your body's in it does, everywhere it gets busy so uh i'll just do very quick summary crash course before you finish up at the very top of my project i have an assembly that's the entire thing uh we know that because it's a or three cubes that are stacked together where one cube is just a component okay this is my tippity top assembly within that assembly I can have more sub assemblies or I can have individual components. So this project is just one piece. So that can go inside the assembly or another piece like this uh, leg assembly is multiple parts. So that's a sub assembly. So if I expand that, you can see this sub assembly is made up of uh, five components. Uh, whereas just this one is made of just one component, so that's fine. Inside each component, so the yeah, that's fine. Uh, the leg, leg number four leg strut block. Uh, if I expand that, that is made up of the three D body and two sketches uh, and my assembly context, but we won't go over that. Um, also, all of those things are held inside the component, which is held inside a sub assembly which is held inside an assembly which is held inside a folder which is held inside a project that's the entirety of the hierarchy of fusion 360. that's a really nice short i think we'll make a short video on that here soon Maybe. i i also so one one clarifying question right there at the end is let's say you've got it's a single component right it's a single part but it has a work plane or it has a canvas that you've dragged into it. Is that mm -hmm. when you would say, okay, even though this is only a single part, would you still create it? You would create a new component for that or a new so when sub assembly start, for that? Sorry, not a new component, new sub assembly for that. I would, yeah. So depending on if you start a new component or an, even a component under that and goes more and more and more, saying where is that canvas stored is really important. If the canvas is for the entire project, then you want to activate the top assembly. And that's where you'd like the canvas to be because you know all of the parts that make up that assembly will then use that canvas. If you know that just one of those components is going to be using that picture, then store it inside that component. So it's up to you. Store the information um, where you're most likely to need to use it. Yeah. If you have, um, think about it on just storing pictures, for example. If you have your pictures tab on your on your desktop and you've got it, you know, 2024, 2023, yada, 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 all the way down, you know, obviously you would put all the photos about that year in that folder. But if you have just a picture of, I don't know, just the layout of your house for some odd reason, where it's not specific to uh, a year, it's just kind of a picture that you have, then you can have it outside of that folders but still inside the picture folder Beautiful. so i hope that makes sense lovely this has been the cat class podcast once again i'm josh i'm jake and we will see you all next week see you guys